When this series of lectures began in 1999, uh, General Guthrie uh, gave the inaugural address, and as you'll know, he had just led the armed forces through the 1998 uh, Strategic uh, Defence Review. And I don't think he's here, but if he was, he would um, reaffirm how difficult the task of the Chief of Defence Staff is uh, during a defence review, um, and indeed one might say at any stage thereafter, but I'm learning that still. I would like to start by paying tribute to my immediate predecessor, Jock Stirrup. Uh, he brought huge experience and sagacity to the role through a difficult time for Britain, a time in which our armed forces were fighting on two fronts in Iraq and Afghanistan, a time in which the a threat to our nation was and continues to be diverse, evolving and clearly unpredictable and at a time when uh, the country's fiscal position has required significant belt tightening uh, across government and rightly in my view including uh, in defence. As difficult as the decisions in the SDSR have been and they have now been made um, and as an amateur historian as I've said on one or two other occasions um, I would agree that that life can only be understood by looking backwards. So I do want to set out tonight the thinking behind what we have called the adaptable posture, which we will assume as a result of the SDSR. But life at the same time can only be lived by moving forward. And we've received in military speak, as those servicemen here will know, uh, what we call our commander's intent in the form of the national security strategy, which, by the way, tends to be slightly obscure by the uh, SDSR itself, which I think we would term um, in the military our specific orders, if you like, as opposed to the intent that precedes it. And my task as CDS is now to lead the armed forces through the changes that are required. I'd like to talk briefly about the progress being made in Afghanistan, which, to remind you, is the absolute priority of the National Security Council, the Ministry of Defence and the Armed Forces, and will remain our priority over the coming years, and was an essential consideration in the SDSR. The Defence Secretary reiterated in Parliament last month that Afghanistan is our main effort. And as I've said in the past, our actions there are vital for the short and long-term national security of our country. And I, as I said, I was in Afghanistan uh, three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, and again last week with the Prime Minister uh, when I accompanied him on his visit there. And all I can tell you is that the change from when I commanded there in 2006 could not be more apparent. Uh, today, Governor Mangle is driving around Helmand and officials are travelling alone to and from the districts of the province, uh, something you couldn't begin to think was possible, I'd say, even nine months ago. And I took chai, for example, with, with local people in the heart of Nad Ali district, overlooking a road uh, busy with people and traffic. And in 2006, that I couldn't even have gone near the place without being shot at. Um, the right force levels with the right equipment across ISAF as a whole, but particularly in Helmand, are now delivering what we knew then was the right strategy, but seemed unattainable. A strategy that has seen General Petraeus achieve so much by focusing on the people and a political settlement to which I'll return. Now, of course, the significant uplift in troop numbers means an accelerated tempo of operations, and we can expect the going to remain tough and at more lives to be lost, including British lives, because war is never without risk, and risk is intrinsic to military operations, and those of us in the military absolutely understand that. We sometimes have a struggle getting it across to others. It is recognised by every soldier, every sailor, every airman, and every marine I lead. The public is right to honour their bravery and commitment, 
but supporting the servicemen and women means understanding their mission. Because the mission in Afghanistan, as our Prime Minister has made clear, is one of national security. Our forces are there ultimately to keep the public here in Britain safe, safe from the consequences of failure in Afghanistan, safe from the violent extremists who would make the region their base, and safe from the operations that terrorists would train for and plan from those havens. The sacrifice being made is not being made in vain. It is absolutely in keeping with the very proud heritage of the British Armed Forces. There is cause for cautious optimism despite uh, significant challenges. We are, are now operating from a position of increasing strength while the position of the insurgency has undoubtedly begun to deteriorate. In Pakistan, safe havens are being squeezed by Pakistan security forces. The insurgency is under unprecedented pressure and has lost significant ground in their southern heartland, including in the key population centres. And we have been successfully targeting their bomb-making uh, networks and their command structure. Their senior leadership is isolated, their training becoming deficient, and their supplies disrupted. The Afghan National Security Forces have grown by over a third this year, ahead of the agreed targets, and are increasingly effective and beginning to lead operations, which, along with the political outreach, is key to the plan for transition to homegrown security. And as agreed at the NATO conference in Lisbon, and according to the wishes of the Afghan government, the ANSF will take the lead on security from the end of 2014. And that is why, as the Prime Minister said, British troops will not be in combat roles by 2015. Of course, we all recognise that the UK relationship with Afghanistan will continue for many years to come, including an enduring and highly supportive defence relationship. But let me be quite clear what we mean by that. Uh, with India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, for example, peoples with whom we have a history longer and in some ways more fraught than with Kabul, we now have enduring partnerships as equals. We trade, we help train officials, exchange information and provide development assistance. We plan to do the same in Afghanistan. <coughs> British trainers and mentors will stay in Afghanistan and their efforts will continue alongside those of aid workers and diplomats. Now, these diplomatic development and defence relationships underpin our partnership and we look forward to deepening them over the years ahead. Afghanistan will, I am confident, contribute to the network of partners and allies that the UK has developed over the centuries. I agree wholeheartedly with the Secretary of State that failing to win the war we're currently fighting would be a betrayal of the armed forces, the British people and our national security. But I also agree that configuring to fight that war to the exclusion of all else would have been a blindness to other possible threats to that very national security. The decisions taken in the SDSR have rightly been on the basis of what I think was quite excellent analysis done in the national security strategy and I would draw your attention again to that rather than necessarily just the SDSR. Uh, today there is no single all-encompassing threat which requires our total concentration to the exclusion of others as there was during the Cold War. None of the threats we face from terrorism to piracy, from regional instability to energy security, from climate change to cyber, None of these is at a definitive tipping point. The government has not drawn the same strategic conclusion as some wanted, not because there's a lack of strategic direction, but the reverse, to maintain our strategic freedom of manoeuvre. We could have reconfigured the capabilities of our armed forces towards the defence of Europe, 
and our immediate environment, our environs, as some did argue for, but that choice was rejected. We could have reconfigured towards peacekeeping rather than war fighting, but that choice too was rejected. We could have reconfigured towards counter-terrorism and domestic security, but that choice was rejected. These options and other scenarios were rejected because they were not supported by the analysis underpinning the national security strategy as being in Britain's long-term interests. The adaptable posture, which retains the ability of the UK to act at distance, independently where required, across all domains, providing the capacity for, for prevention, for deterrence, both conventional and nuclear, for coercion and intervention, is a rational extension of the national security strategy. And putting it into practice will create what we are calling Future Force 2020. It will be a formidable and powerful uh, organisation, joint and across each service. If we stayed as we were, we would not be successful in 2020 and beyond. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And we have turned the corner, I would argue we have further to go, in configuring for future warfare. I recently said that in my role of CDS, I stand on the shoulders of giants, the first of which are the men and women of Britain's armed forces, who I have the honour of leading. One need only read the citations published alongside the operational honours list to understand why the people of the United Kingdom are rightly proud of their armed forces. And second, but no less important, are the families of our serving personnel. They are the rock upon which our armed forces are built, and too often this is neglected. At this time of year in particular, with more than 15,000 people on operations and deployments around the world, not just in Afghanistan, we should rightly recognise their selfless commitment and thank them for their fortitude. And third, I stand here, of course, on the shoulders of my illustrious predecessors, some of whom are in the room, who have led Britain's armed forces through darkness and through light, and whom I am proud and humble to follow. The armed forces have a challenging path ahead to succeed in Afghanistan and on all other operations, to make a reality of the vision set out in the SDSR, and to act wherever necessary to keep the people of this country safe. But we will move forward with confidence, we will always do our duty, we will meet every challenge and we will prevail. That is the history of your, of Britain's armed forces and that too I'm absolutely confident is our future. Thank you very much.